says in the jacket, the publisher suggests alternating between Sam and Haley reading eight pages at a time. Is that also your suggestion, or and why? What's no, that? I mean, I think there's there's a great deal of fun of just sort of approaching a book like this and not really knowing what to do with it. You know, that experience of okay, is this the front? Is this the front? Do I read the historical columns? Do I read the whole page? How does it fit together? You know. It, that's pretty daunting. You know, it's a lot like climbing the mountain without a trail. Most people want a trail. They're not, you know, explorers. So I look at it as kind of a trailhead. You know, it works. It definitely makes it easier. Sam is harder because his vocabulary derives from, you know, starts in the 1860s. It's going to be much more familiar. Haley's easier. So if you're reading Haley, who starts in 1960, and then you're reading Sam, you actually begin, they translate each other in a way. And that's sort of so it works. I'm not against it. It's a trailhead, but there's certainly other ways to approach it. From what I read, uh, read in interviews, um, you talking about House of Leaves. It sounded as if you had written a majority of the book and then were relegated to a small room in the, house, the publishing office, where you then began to lay it out right. on a computer. Um, whereas the process you're describing now sounds as if the layout and the, the structure was very much something in your mind at the forefront of the book's composition. I'm wondering what, if any, lessons you learned from your from your work on House of Leaves, and how did those lessons kind of translate into your different approach this time? Well, it was weird, because in some ways I thought, okay, well, I did House of Leaves, I figured out all this stuff, and so the layout shouldn't be an issue. But because it was such a different type of book, in a way, I, there were a whole different series of problems that I had to face. Um, I mean, the, the most important thing is, I've never looked, I, and maybe I'm just fortunate, but there was never an antagonistic relationship with my publisher. You know, it was, it was always, we were always working together. So House of Leaves was all laid out, and, um, but the problem was is I've written a lot of it in Word, which has terrible reflow problems. And at the time, Quark or any of the sort of the, the, the formal publishing softwares couldn't handle footnotes. So we really couldn't do the footnotes in Quark. You know, it wouldn't, we couldn't transfer that document into Quark. So that was, so ultimately we had to, to use this incredibly unknown technology called PDFs at the time. <laughs> we, we converted the word into PDFs, and then that way we could fix the reflow problem. Um, I was also at the time using Mac fonts, and those had to be replaced with, you know, with professional fonts in essence. Well, the book, it, when, you know, the, the book was around 680, 90 pages, something like that. And then we added, we, we, we substituted new fonts, just the same fonts, times, but they were, they were professional fonts. And it reflowed the document to like 1,200 pages, <laughs> right? And that was because the kerning and the letting was all different. So we had to go in and adjust that, you know. So obviously, I didn't go back to Word. And I didn't go back to those bad fonts, you know. So there were th there were things I learned in, in that sense. Um, and then you know, finally, there were elements that had to be laid out in work, and that's when I went to Pantheon, and they were just an extraordinary, and they gave me a pass 24/7. You know, I mean, this was pre 9/11, but I just wandered in there every morning. I was there for you know, 20 hours a day practically, just typesetting this thing in work, and. Um, <coughs> And that was great, you know, it was amazing. You know, I finally got to bring all this stuff and there was no reflow problem, which I was always happy about. And, uh, and that was really exciting. On this one, again, there were a lot of complexities. Like, you know, even though it seems simple how to diminish a font, you know, in a, in a, in a sort of unnoticeable way, it requires a certain kind of strength and flexibility on the part of the font. So the advantage was is that I could, you know, email or call um, Peter Anderson and talk about fonts. You know, I knew people there, and um, and the same with the ink. When I was dealing with the colors and making sure that the, the green was right and the, the O's would register correctly, then I could call up Andy Hughes and we could talk about that and how the paper worked. So it happened all the time. You know, when I was when I was proofreading this thing, the the, the galley itself had about four thousand corrections. You know? So now the fail rate on any kind of corrective process is about 10 to 15 percent. So we're talking already 400 errors are going to be made in the correction. So that means I have to go through the corrected galley and compare it to the new, the new printed 
you know, um, addition and find those errors and put them through. And then that I actually hired a couple of assistants to do it because I just simply couldn't see it anymore. I couldn't see those words. And so then that brought it down to 40 and then still there was five or six or 12 at the very end. But the, the you know, one of the great things about, about the internet is that we could, we could do it. We could literally write the day before it shipped to, you know, the printing presses. We could, you know, Lydia Buchler and I could work on these, these little typos and make these corrections. Um, and then, even there was then there was even a wonderful creative collaboration with the, with the folios themselves, which you know they were you know they rotate in the in the course of you know these, the page numbers within you flip them they rotate around right. And I initially had had actually put the circles together right, and for me that was sort of it was emblematic of the eight pages eight pages obviously infinity all sorts of things like that. But the problem is is the book isn't really about infinity. It's about there's a recurrences of cycles, and yet there is a finitude to relationships and to lives. And that was sort of the balance. So Peter Anderson and I were talking about this, and I wanted more of a sort of spherical shape, and I needed the, the sort of the green to blur into the gold a little better. But then what we decided is actually to nudge those two circles apart just by, you know, a sixteenth of an inch. Because that way you still get the, the sense of infinity, the sense of eight, and yet also could be two zeros, you know, and it's suddenly separated. So there was a lot of work that went into just like figuring out little stuff like that. And then Alti Carper and I would talk about, you know, grammatical rules were they consistent within the context of who Sam and Haley were. And so there were endless discussions about all of that stuff. And so I think really what happened, what, what it was, it was about relationships. It was about, you know, just, you know, being enthusiastic about books, excited about books, seeing could we reasonably take a book to this place, could we do it. We didn't know if we were going to get ribbons. I mean, there were all sorts of ideas of how to do the placeholders, you know, package it with index cards, could we use the, the jacket flap, you know. And ultimately Andy Hughes came through in a big way and managed to figure out how to do the ribbons. Because ribbons are, you know, machines are designed to put ribbons in on the top of a book. Not on both sides. It just doesn't happen. So does that mean you're going to have a print run and then you're going to run it backwards, or you know? So there was a whole deal that had to be figured out just on the manufacturing of it all, you know. And uh, so that kind of answers your question. <laughs> um, I have kind of a two-part question. Yeah, is there any water, by the way? Where is it? Yes. Uh, I just have a diet coke, actually. Great. So much. Yes. Um, I haven't read *Only Revolution* yet. But, uh, <laughs> Bad man. <Yeah. laughs> I mean, there is a test. Right? <laughs> <laughs> um, but I sense from sort of something that we have it and hearing what you read and then combining a couple of things that clearly this idea or this theme of like shifting. Mm -hmm. and it's kind of. Um, That's true, yeah. It's sort of like a, a sort of intention without logic or without cognition. It's sort of phenomenological right. that way. So I, the first part of the question I'm wondering is. Is there any like one or two or a handful of philosophers or writers that are sort of standard for you in terms of inspiration? And then the second one is the fact that it is this sort of um, it's sort of this pre-cognitive intention. I think is, and I could be wrong. Come in wrong. But um, I wonder how much of that inspiration that you get from these people you try to logically implement, if at all, into your writing. Um, it's a bit of both, you know, I mean, it's, you know, having, you know, having been educated uh, and sort of taught, you know, Derrida or Heidegger or Hegel um, or even just, you know, more contemporary literary criticism. You know, those things are definitely, I mean, I, I don't know if I can accurate, accurately gauge how influential they are, mm -hmm. because certainly they were, they were the bedrock of what I studied when I was in college. Um, and as weird as that is, I mean, it's only four years of your life as an undergrad. They, there's still some very significant, you know, rewiring that goes on, you know. So, but certainly, you do get more, you become more and more conscious. So I knew that there was a certain, I guess I look at it musically. I, you know, I, 
you know, you look at, you read Derrida, and you begin, you, you, you get familiar with the way he handles the scales, you know, the way he handles certain key changes, you know, there's a certain, there's certain a way around certain topics, there's certain dodges, there's certain, you know, little, little, you know, little tricks that he has, right? And if you're thinking about it musically, then you suddenly go, well, that's not the music of this particular piece. So for me, I, I did end up by chance coming across Agamben, but Agamben became much more interesting to me because he was always moving away from the sign, and, and that was one thing I didn't want in the book. I didn't want there to be, you know, a sort of a constant referral to text, to words, to writing, that's self-reflective. So words, text, signs, you know, billboards, none of it exists in only revolutions. I mean, this in the end pa papers, in fact, even though it's a mirror image, are is sort of the starter list of every of all the words that do not appear in the revolutions, you know. So for instance, or doesn't appear because there's no choice. Sam and Haley are everything, always, you know. Um, so in that sense it's very conscious. You know, you're looking for a certain music, you're looking, okay, this is what Wordsworth did, I don't know. Um, but for just sort of bedrock inspiration, I think at this point in my life it really is kind of getting outside of books. You know, for me, it's it's reading, but at the same time, it's I look at I look at House of Leaves more as a journeyman's piece, really. I mean, I understand its roots and, and I understand its sort of designs, but there's a point when, as a as a writer, I think it's important to move away from just the self-referential canon of predecessors and actually go and sit and listen to conversations. You know, the two homeless kids are having or picking up other stuff a little outside of there, and then bringing it back to the page. And it's a lot more work. It's primary research. It's, you know, it's undergrads deal with, you know, secondary research and, and whatnot. But as you, as you get higher and higher, you really got to go out in the field and, and, and get your stuff. And so I'm looking for it everywhere, constantly. That's part of my job. Mark, thank you very much. We're going to have to cut it short oh, there. Finally. Thank you, everybody, for thank coming you. out. Um, we've got refreshments here. We also have Mark's titles on sale over here. Please please get a book. I'm sure Mark would be happy to sign a book for you up front. That's it. Thank you, everybody.